and welcome to the second lecture of term for the module space and time. Um, so this lecture will be picking up uh, on the theme of uh, the previous lecture, uh, the discussion between absolutism and relationalism. Um, and we're going to discuss a couple of issues uh, related to this debate. Um, uh, one of which will be a relationist response uh, to the sort of Newtonian absolutist view uh, that we discussed last week. Um, and this relationist response um, was uh, put forward in particular by uh, the, the philosopher Leibniz, who uh, many of you may have already heard of or studied. Um, but first, what I'm going to do is say just a bit more about uh, the nature of the space that uh, Newton took to be absolute. So, in particular, I mentioned last week that Newton supposes that space is Euclidean in structure. Uh, that is, not only is he supposing that space is absolute, he's uh, supposing that uh, there's a particular uh, type of space that exists, namely one that has this Euclidean structure or obeys uh, a certain set of axioms. Um, uh, set out by the, the mathematician Euclid. So um, I'm I'm going to outline that first and then, and then we'll start to talk about Leibniz uh, and then we'll look at a rather different argument, uh, different to Newton's, uh, for the view that space is, is actually absolute. Um, and that's going to be an argument uh, due to Kant, um, which we'll come back to towards the end of the lecture. Okay, so I will just pull up the wrong one. I will pull up the uh, the handout. Um, so yeah, the the Leibniz Clark debate and also the the Kantian uh, issue of incongruent counterparts is going to be the the topic for for this week. Um, so yeah okay great so Euclidean space so this is the sort of space time structure or spatial structure uh, that was presupposed by um, by Newton so when I say presupposed by um, really his uh, laws New Newton's laws his, his physical laws um, seem to presuppose this sort of a spatial structure really I think um, at the time that Newton was writing, um, it was pretty much universally supposed that, um, assuming space exists or is absolute, um, then uh, physical space is going to have a Euclidean structure. It's really more recently uh, that it's been proposed that physical space um, uh, might exist, but, but have a, a non-Euclidean structure. And we'll we'll come to that uh, later in term, in particular uh, from the fifth lecture onwards. Okay, so what does it mean to say that uh, space has a Euclidean structure? Well, Euclidean space is characterized by five axioms, uh, which are listed on, on the handout. Um, so first axiom hopefully seems straightforward enough. There's a straight line between any two points. So if A and B are points in the space, then you can connect them with a straight line. Uh, in a moment, I'll talk about spaces where that might not be the case. Um, second axiom, a straight line of finite length can be extended indefinitely in either direction. So hopefully that's fairly intuitive. Just if you've got a line from point A to, to point B, um, then you could extend that, that straight line um, beyond point A uh, or beyond point B, uh, so in either direction. And you could extend that indefinitely. Again, I'll come back to uh, the topic of spaces where that might not be so. Um, Axiom three says that the combination of any point in space together with any radius determines a circle. Uh, that is to say, if you choose a point in space and you choose a radius, um, then uh, taken together, uh, we could essentially, if you like, draw a circle or there is a circle uh, with uh, that, that point P uh, 
um, is its center and with that point and with that radius. Um, uh, and that circle uh, uh, could be drawn uh, entirely within the space or falls with that entirely within the space. Um, axiom four uh, maybe sounds a little bit weird. Um, axiom four is that all right angles are equal. Um, so that's a bit of a weird one, right? So basically, um, uh, you might think, well, all right angles are 90 degrees. Um, so, yeah, of course, they're equal. That, that, that's kind of obvious. Um, and I, I think sort of like a lot of people throughout uh, since Euclid's time have thought have been a bit puzzled by this axiom. So isn't this just true by definition that all right angles are equal? Um, so I think a lot of people have that reaction. Um, it's just a definition of what, what a right angle is, that it's 90 degrees. And so so obviously any right angle is going to equal 90 degrees. Um, uh, actually, some people have had almost an opposite reaction, which is, well, you know, shouldn't we be able to prove this, that all right angles are equal? So shouldn't it actually be not an axiom uh, of Euclidean geometry, but rather a theorem? So there's a lot of puzzlement being uh, provoked by this axiom. Um, we don't really need to, for our purposes, to get into that. If you're interested in um, uh, in why Euclid might add it as an extra axiom, um, then there's actually an interesting uh, uh, Scientific American blog post on it um, uh, that I've linked from the handout. So uh, feel free to follow up on, on that if you're interested. Okay, axiom five... Um, you know, possibly the, the the in in some ways the most interesting of them all, and and pos uh, probably the one that's been discussed throughout history more than any of the others. Um, sometimes called the parallel postulate. Um, this says if a straight line A intersects with two other straight lines B and C, which lie on a common plane, and the interior angles between A and B and between B and C, sum to less than two right angles, I guess less than 180 degrees, um, then if B and C are extended indefinitely, they will eventually meet. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it's best, I think, seen uh, with reference to the diagram on the handout figure one. Um, so uh, we've got this, this line, this straight line A, um, and it intersects with another straight line B, um, and also with another straight line C. And um, the interior angle between A and B is given by this, this angle alpha. Um, and then the interior angle between A and C is given by uh, beta. Um, and the idea is that uh, alpha plus beta uh, is less than 180 degrees. So uh, they, they sum to less uh, than... Uh, the sum of two right angles. And so suppose that, um, uh, you know, maybe we've drawn um, uh, B and C um, to the extent shown by the uh, the solid line. Uh, the idea is if you were to extep, extend uh, B and C, so this is kind of illustrated by the dotted lines, um, if you were to extend them far enough, then eventually they'd meet just because... Uh, the sum of alpha and beta is uh, less than the sum of two right angles. It's less than 180 degrees. So, you know, this should seem fairly intuitive. In, in many ways, Euclidean geometry is a fairly intuitive geometry. Um, uh, but again, it doesn't necessarily, uh, well, it doesn't hold of, of, of any spaces uh, that we might like to consider. So, uh, as we'll see, it's the sort of, if you want to argue that the physical space that we live in is Euclidean, uh, then actually, you know, this is a substantive argument. It's it's um, and actually, it, it looks like the space, the physical space we live in, um, isn't in fact Euclidean, as we'll see when we look at uh, general relativity, and which is uh, the the topic of. Um, I think, well, lecture five, lecture six of this term. Um, okay, so a bit of explanation of the axioms and a, a bit of uh, 
explanation of why Newton's laws might be thought to presuppose um, these axioms. Well, I mean, to start with, actually last week in the last lecture, we saw that Newton's first law, um, namely that um, if an object is at rest or in, in inertial motion, um, that is not accelerating, um, then provided uh, it's not acted upon by any force, it will remain at rest if it started at rest or at inertial, in inertial motion uh, if it started in inertial motion. So in other words, it won't accelerate unless a force acts upon it. All right, so why does this presuppose axiom two? Well, when we talk about inertial motion, um, the idea is that uh, an object that's, that, that is in inertial motion um, is going to be maintaining a constant speed, uh, which might be zero, right? It might be at rest, uh, or it might be a positive speed, but, but just a constant one. Um, and it's going to be going, assuming it is at a positive speed, it's going to be going in a straight line through the space. Um, why? Well, remember uh, that speed isn't to be confused uh, with velocity, right? So uh, velocity is directed. So technically, if you change direction, even if you're going at the same speed, uh, then technically that counts as an acceleration, right? So inertial motion is motion in a straight line, right? A motion uh, without change of direction. So Newton's first law is saying that uh, an object that's uh, moving inertially, that is moving in a straight line at constant speed, uh, will carry on doing so indefinitely, uh, so long as no force acts upon that object. Um, but it supposes that it's possible to carry on moving in a single direction in a straight line uh, indefinitely. And that's precisely what axiom two says, right? That it is possible in a Euclidean space to do this. So you're not, for instance, going to bump into a boundary of, of space um, if you carry on for too long, right? Uh, actually, no, in Euclidean space, you can, you can carry on moving in that same uh, direction forever. Okay. Um, so that's one example of why uh, Newton's laws seem to presuppose uh, uh, the Euclidean axioms. Um, okay. Um, all right. So, I mean, I, I won't go into that in, t in too much depth, um, but it might be worth sort of commenting at least on um, some possible non-Euclidean spaces. Um, as I've said, um, uh, it seems from general relativity that that maybe the space, the physical space that we inhabit, is non-Euclidean. Um, I'm not going to go into a discussion of what that space might be like um, until later in term. Um, so for now, I just want to uh, point out that there are such things as non-Euclidean spaces. Um, I'm going to give some examples. Uh, None of these examples is plausibly, particularly plausibly, what our space is like. Um, but they're just examples of possible spaces that are non-Euclidean. So, I mean, to start with, any space that has boundaries um, in which lines can't be extended indefinitely um, is non-Euclidean, right? So, uh, because just because... Um, Axiom two is going to get violated by spaces that are that are bounded. Um, axiom five also slightly more subtly uh, will be violated by spaces that are not bounded because again axiom five uh, rests upon the idea that you can continue to uh, extend uh, straight lines like B and C for as long as you want, um, um, and that uh, when you do so they'll eventually meet. Um, Actually, interestingly, axiom three also seems to presuppose uh, that uh, space doesn't have boundaries. 
Um, so the reason is that if space had a boundary, then if you chose a, uh, a point P, say, close to that boundary and a radius R that was bigger than the distance between P and the boundary, um, then there wouldn't be a circle corresponding to point P and radius R that lay entirely within that space. So uh, bounded spaces are the, the sorts of things that don't uh, obey the Euclidean axioms. Um, okay, um, so that, those are examples. That's, they, they, uh, bounded spaces provide examples of how um, axiom 2, 3, and 5 could be violated. Um, as I say, axiom 4 is a bit of a weird one. Um, um, so we, we won't um we won't worry about that 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 one um um but but there's sort of interesting violations of of axiom one um or uh, so so some interesting spaces violate axiom one um so for instance um consider this sort of hourglass shaped space that's illustrated in figure two um it looks like the so so suppose a is a point in the interior of the hourglass and and so is b um then it seems that um although a and b are two points in this hourglass space uh they can't be connected by a straight line right so um if you try to imagine a straight line between a and b uh that's going to be a, a line that takes us outside of the space right um so uh, an hourglass shaped space is the sort of thing that might um, violate axiom one and there, there are other examples too but but that will suffice for the present okay now um just because it's going to come in useful um later on in this lecture there's a few kind of you know sort of slight technical ge geometric notions um that uh that um, might come in handy um, some of you might have come across these notions. Uh, I mean, I think there are some um, physics students amongst you. Uh, but in any case, you know, you, you, uh, others might have encountered this in, you know, I guess, A-level geometry and so on. Um, so um, the, the notions are those of, of, of translations. Um, so translation... Uh, I think it sort of helps to to look at the 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 uh, the next figure, so figure three, um, in thinking about some of these operations that we can perform um, on a uh, a geometric shape in a Euclidean space, right? So um, a translational as a translation um, is the movement of all. Of the points of a geometric figure, or if you like, or or, or a region of, of space, um, by the same distance in the same direction. So, uh, figure A uh, corresponds to a translation. So we've got this geometric figure, um, and basically what we've done in um, um, uh, in transforming uh, the the upper left version to the the lower right version, is uh, just to perform a, a translation. So we've taken all of the points in the upper left version, and we've moved them uh, each in the same way. That is, each uh, by the same distance and in the same direction, or in other words, by the same vector um, in our space, and. Um, I suppose sort of what is interesting about that is that uh, at least when we do that in a Euclidean space, um, then the, repro the properties of the geometric figure uh, are preserved, right? So uh, the uh, dist, for instance, in the, in this example, uh, the distance uh, between um, each point in the figure and the angles at which different lines, for instance, uh, lie uh, from one another is preserved uh, in this uh, in this translation. 
Um, so that the idea that um, such properties as um, uh, distance and angle properties uh, are preserved in uh, such a transformation uh, is known as a symmetry of the space. So in other words, what we're saying is that Euclidean space is subject to translational symmetry, right? So if you take a geometric figure uh, and you translate it, that is to say you move each point in it uh, by the same distance in the same direction, in other words, by the same vector, uh, then the result is a geometric figure um, in which all of the distances between points and angles, between lines and so on, is preserved, um, um, is the same as in the, 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 the kind of first version of the figure, if you like. Um, so uh, Euclidean, there are some spaces that are not going to be like that. They're not going to have translational uh, symmetry, but Euclidean space does. Uh, another symmetry of uh, Euclidean space is rotational uh, symmetry. So what's a rotation? Again, it's a, another form of transformation, um, but it's different from a, a translational transformation. Um, in particular, a rotation is a circular movement. So we can define it, uh, it's defined in the handout, uh, the circular movement of all the points of a geometric figure around a fixed point, um, such that um, uh, the distance from each point in the figure uh, to the fixed point in question is preserved. So uh, in, in B, uh, what we've done is we've taken a, a geometric figure and we've rotated it around um, the point X. Um, so the idea is that the, if you like, if so suppose the upper right version of the figure is a kind of starting point. Um, then we've rotated it through 180 degrees. That is to say, uh, we've moved it such that... Um, we've uh, preserved the distance between each point in this figure um, and uh, the point x. Uh, and the result, again, is a figure uh, which has the same uh, distances, internal distances between all of its points and angles between all of its uh, its lines and so forth. So uh, uh, we, we, uh, this, this is an instance of... of um, uh, a rotation, a symmetry preserving rotation, and uh, what uh, we find is that um, in Euclidean space, uh, all rotations um, are, uh, preserve uh, distances and angles in that manner, uh, and so this is a, another symmetry of Euclidean space. Okay. All right. Now, um, I mean, you don't need to worry about this too much, but um, uh, there is a notion of a direct um, isometry in uh, in space. Um, and the idea is that a direct isometry, well, let's go back a bit. So uh, to say a transformation, so we've just been considering two 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 sorts of transformations, namely translation and rotation. Um, to say that uh, a transformation is isometric means that uh, all of the distance relations uh, and therefore geometrical properties of the figure are preserved, right? So um, uh, we've seen that in Euclidean space, uh, uh, translations um, and rotations are examples of isometric uh, transformations, or you might say symmetries. Um, now, um, to say that a, a transformation is directly isometric is to say not only that the transformation is isometric, that is, it preserves all distance relations, but also it preserves orientation, right? So to get an idea of what's going on here, what we're saying here, uh, Think of a uh, mirror uh, symmetry, uh, or, a, or rather a mirror transformation. Um, so here we, we might think we start with the, the, the um, uh, figure on the left, 
and we've reflected it in the line y um, uh, to come up with the, the figure on the right here. Now, what's interesting is that, uh, so, so basically reflection, what we're doing is, uh, uh, is we preserve the distance between each point uh, in the figure and each point in the line y, right? So uh, the figure on the left, each point in it is the same distance uh, from the line y as the corresponding point um, on, on the right. Now, um, this is uh, a, an, I, uh, an isometry of Euclidean space. So uh, we've, going back to the definition of an isometry, uh, we've preserved all of the relation, or, or sorry, all of the distance relations um, between points in the figure when we've reflected it in the line y. Um, so, for instance, um, the distance between um, the the um, the the, the uh, uh, points where the line intersects, uh, the lines intersect one another. Uh, are maintained on the right-hand side, uh, uh, um, the, uh, identically to the way they are on the left-hand side. Um, <clears throat> but there's something important that's not uh, preserved, uh, and that's orientation. Um, so in what sense is orientation not preserved? Um, well, well, we'll come back uh, to that when we talk about Kant in the, the sort of final part of this lecture. Um, and um, uh, we'll see that the, we'll get more, we'll sort of go more into the notion of, 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 of what it means for, for an object to have orientation. And what we'll find is that interestingly, Kant uh, gives an argument that appeals to this, that appeals to the idea that um, uh, reflection isn't an, a direct isometry of Euclidean space uh, in arguing, maybe this is a surprising conclusion, that space-time must be absolute. But that's something we'll come back to, so, so bracket that for now. Um, but for now, just um, I think the sort of take-home message is um, that uh, uh, there are these symmetries or isometries of Euclidean geometry um, translation rotation uh, uh, to examples um, uh, and reflection is also an example but it's not a, a direct asymmetry um, and uh, uh, it, that is to say it doesn't preserve orientation okay so all right so that that was some sort of background and uh, you'll sort of see the significance of that as we uh, get further into the, the sort of philosophical material, um, which we're now going to turn to. We're going to now turn to more, more, uh, if you like, more more philosophical material uh, rather than just describing features of, of Euclidean geometry. So, um, as promised this week, we're going to spend a bit more time focusing upon arguments for relationism, uh, arguments that... Uh, uh, maybe um, 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 count against uh, Newton and count against uh, his bucket argument. So maybe they go somewhere to towards undermining that. But we'll see uh, as we go along. Um, so Leibniz, um, uh, interestingly, um, advocated uh, something like a relationist view of space and was critical of Newton um, uh, and his presupposition um, uh, of absolute space. So this really comes out actually not in a discussion between Leibniz and Newton himself, but rather an interesting discussion uh, taking the form of correspondence, a series of letters uh, between Leibniz um, and uh, Samuel Clarke, who was a philosopher, uh, not as well known, um, and who defended uh, Newton's views? So he's a sort of was a, a sort of advocate for Newton and Newtonianism, um, and in particular an advocate for the view that uh, space is absolute, um, as we saw Newton argued it to be. Um, 
so they, they had a very interesting discussion on this question of absolutism versus relationism. Um, now, it's worth bearing in mind that um, ours was pretty standard for the, the time in question. Uh, both of these philosophers assumed, like Newton, that if there is absolute space, um, then that absolute space is going to have a Euclidean structure. Um, so obey Euclid's axioms. Um, that's worth bearing in mind just to understand the sort of structure of the debate between them. Now, okay, so in the course of their back and forth, uh, Clark made the interesting observation that if space is absolute, um, as Newton supposed it to be, um, then it's coherent to suppose that all of the material objects in space uh, should have been shifted, right? So they could have been in a different place from the place that they're actually in. Um, in particular, um, it seems possible, if you believe in absolute space, um, that all of the material universe should be shifted by, say, a meter in a particular direction. Now, if you shifted everything by a meter in a particular direction, uh, and if we suppose that the absolute space is Euclidean, um, then essentially what this amounts to um, is just one of these uh, translations that we described above. So it's a... Uh, the movement uh, of uh, each uh, piece of matter by the same distance in the same direction, in other words, by the same vector. And what we know, what we've seen, is that uh, trans translations um, are um, uh, a form of symmetry um, in uh, Euclidean space. Um, that is to say, a, a, an isometry. Um, and so it will mean that distance relations between material objects. So if we, if we shift everything uh, by vector, that is by a particular distance, uh, or everything by the same distance in the same direction, uh, then we're going to preserve all the distance relations um, between the objects themselves. So that's interesting because that means that presumably um, we wouldn't be able to tell, right? So if everything, uh, forget about how it gets shifted, but if everything were shifted, there'd be no empirically discernible difference uh, in how things are, uh, how, how things would be from, from how they actually are. Okay. So it seems that um, on the supposition of a Euclidean space, uh, there are genuine possibilities uh, that are distinct about where all the material, all the material uh, in the world is, right? So it, it, maybe if you like this way of speaking, we might say, well, in the actual world, it's in one particular place. But there's another possible world in which uh, it's in a slightly different place. Maybe it's all shifted um, in a particular direction uh, by one meter. And what's more, those two possible worlds are going to be empirically indistinguishable um, because of this translational symmetry of Euclidean space. So uh, the, the, there'd be no experiment, uh, if you like, that would tell us uh, which of these two possible worlds we inhabited. Um, uh, everything would, would look exactly the same. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that, that on the face of it, it looks like uh, Clark's right about that possibility. Um, now, and, and certainly Leibniz agrees uh, that that, um, uh, that, sh uh, that shift possibility, you know, is is something is a genuine possibility that would uh, be empirically dis indistinguishable from uh, the actual state of affairs. Um, now, Leibniz 
thinks actually this is a problem for the advocates uh, of an absolutist conception of space. Um, and the reason that he thinks that is because he thinks that, well, isn't it kind of weird to posit multiple ways things could be um, such that one couldn't tell the difference? There's no possible uh, empirical way of distinguishing uh, between these two scenarios, the, the scenario in which all of the material universe is in one place and the scenario in which it's all uh, shifted by a vector. Um, now, I should hasten to say that um, Leibniz's argument is quite convoluted um, and it also appeals to, you've probably got the sense from the reading, it also appeals to some metaphysical principles um, that, say, the principle of sufficient reason, for instance, you might have come across, that um, most metaphysicians would be a bit suspicious of today. Um, now, given that this module is not intended as a historical module, uh, but a, uh, a module concerning, um, uh, I mean, um, concerning metaphysics and the metaphysics of space-time, uh, um, we're not going to, I'm not going to attempt to reconstruct a historically accurate version of Leibniz's own argument, but rather uh, what, what I'll do is describe how a similar argument, a sort of Leibniz-inspired argument, might be put in contemporary terms. Um, so I think, you know, Leibniz's argument has been influential but very few philosophers of physics or metaphysicians or physicists uh, would wish to put it in exactly the terms that Leibniz does, appealing to these uh, what might now seem dubious principles like Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason. OK, so with that in mind, um, uh, the sort of contemporary rendering of, of Leibniz's argument um, would say, look, if you believe in absolute space and suppose that that space is Euclidean, then there are two possible worlds um, in which that, that are indiscernible, empirically indiscernible. No possible experiment could tell you which world you lived in. Um, but they're different worlds in the, uh, the, the matter in the universe in one is in a different location uh, from the matter in the other universe. Um, and in particular, uh, the matter in one differs by a translational shift um, from the matter in the other. Now, you might be, so the, the idea is that, that some people are, are just, suspicious of that, that there might be a fact of the matter, that there, there might be different ways things could be, even though it's in principle impossible to empirically detect the difference between those ways. Um, now, things are kind of even worse when you recognise that it's not the case, it's not just, it's not merely uh, that there are two worlds um, that are possible on this assumption of Euclidean absolutism that differ from one another merely um, by a translational uh, uh, by a translation of, of the matter uh, in the universe but there are going to be infinitely many such possibilities or possible worlds um, and that's because within a Euclidean space there are infinitely many uh, translations of uh, the material universe that are possible, right? So you could um, move it in any direction and you could move it by any distance in any direction, right? So remember in particular that Euclidean space is supposed to um, 
be boundless, be bound boundaryless. So there's going to be if you buy this Euclidean absolutism, um, then take some direction. Uh, you could translate the material all the material in the universe by one meter in that direction or two meters in that direction or three meters in that direction and so on. Or, I mean, for that matter, you could translate it by one meter, by 1.1 meter, by 1.11 meters, by 1.111 meters and so on. So you get infinities. Um, so, you know, so I guess one, you, you might say, you know, as though it weren't bad enough that the, according to the Euclidean absolutist, there are two possible worlds that are empirically indistinguishable from one another. Actually, what we're confronted with is an infinity of possible worlds that are empirically indistinguishable from one another, that just differ from each other by um, uh, translational transformations, uh, by uh, 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 shifts according to a vector. Okay. So we'll come back to it, but I suppose one way of thinking about this is in terms of a principle that many of you might already be familiar with, uh, known as Occam's razor, a principle of simplicity or parsimony. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of debate about Occam's razor, whether it's plausible, what it means, and so on. Um, but I guess one straightforward way of understanding it would be as to, as saying something like, as long as you can explain all the same stuff with two given theories, then go for the simpler theory. Now, often Occam's razor is applied in um, scientific theories when, when people are philosophizing, I suppose, about scientific theories. But you might also think it's appropriate to apply it to metaphysical theories. For instance, the difference between absolutism and relationalism. Now, the idea that the relationists might push here is that absolutism violates Occam's razor. Um, in particular, um, it seems that... So the, the relationist is going to argue that... Um, uh, absolutism commits us to not all of these infinitely many different worlds um, that are genuinely different um, but that have no empirical, empirically observable differences. So maybe that in itself is a violation of Occam's razor, right? That that kind of looks, you know, unparsimonious or uneconomical or something like that. Um, whereas the claim would be that relationalism doesn't commit us to that. So re the relationist will say that actually there aren't multiple possibilities here or infinitely many possibilities here. Um, and that's because they're not going to believe that there is a different possibility created by shifting the material universe um, uh, by uh, a particular distance in a particular direction. Um, and that's because such a shift, such a hypothesized shift, remember, preserves all of the spatial relations between the, the matter in the, in the universe. Um, and so the, the relationist, according to the relationist, well, there's no such thing as absolute position. There's all that there is uh, spatial relations between bits of matter. And so there aren't really two or more distinct possibilities here, right? There's the, the, since there's no absolute space, we can't coherently talk about um, two worlds that differ in that all the matter is shifted in absolute space. Uh, there would only be an ontological difference between two possible worlds um, if uh, the spatial relations between objects in the world uh, were changed with respect to one another. 
and such a hypothesized uh, uh, translation um, doesn't do that, right? So the 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 uh, the relationist is just going to deny that there are multiple worlds uh, that differ in the absolute position of matter um, in in space, right? Okay, so so in that sense, their theory looks more parsimonious or economical. Um, and I think there's a deeper point here because, uh, but it's related. I, what the, the relationist is going to say is the substantivalist or the absolutist's ontology is somehow more complex or involves more stuff than it needs to to explain the things that we need explaining. Um, what we really need explaining is empirically observable phenomena. Now, the relationist is going to say we can explain empirically observable phenomena just in terms of the distances and so on between bits of matter. We don't need to appeal to the absolute position of the material universe. Um, and that shows up in the fact that the supposed shifted universes, the ones that uh, differ uh, by a, um, uh, a translation of all the matter in absolute space, there would be no empirical difference, empirically observable difference between them. So the argument is that this very notion of absolute space, this sort of additional structure that the absolutist posits beyond spatial relations, just isn't showing up empirically. It's not doing any empirical work if, you know, it doesn't matter um, where everything in the material universe is located in it. So long as all the spatial relations are preserved, we're going to get the same empirical consequences. They're going to say, well, that just shows that absolute space isn't doing any empirical work. So by Occam's race, we should get rid of it. OK, so so that's the sort of shift argument, or at least that's a shift argument expressed in rather contemporary terms. Um, not quite the way Leibniz himself put it, but similar in spirit. Um, now, a similar idea is the argument surrounded boosted worlds, so-called boosted worlds, right? So... Clark also points out that if space is absolute, then not only are these sort of shifted worlds possible, um, but there could also be worlds that are like ours, except that all the matter in the universe is moving through space at a uniform velocity, right? So, I don't know. If, if um, our space is absolute... Um, and if it's Euclidean, then um, there's going to be a fact about where the... Well, I suppose there's going to be a fact... Of, so uh, maybe the best way of thinking about it is there's going to be... a. I mean, there is a centre of mass of the material universe. Um, and that centre of mass uh, might be at rest at absolute rest, uh, or it might be moving about, right? Um, now, the idea would be that if we do live in a Euclidean absolute space, then it would make sense to suppose that uh, there's a universe that differs from ours um, in only the respect that the the center of mass of the universe is drifting um, in a certain direction at a certain constant rate. So otherwise it doesn't differ from ours. Uh, so in other words, you, the universe with respect to ours is moving through space at a, a uniform velocity. Uh, so that just seems to make sense uh, if you're an absolutist. You can make sense of that notion of uh, a difference in absolute velocity of uh, the center of mass of the universe. But again, we're supposing that the relative velocities of particular material objects, like the sun and the moon and so on, um, is the same in this hypothesized world as in the actual world. Now, 
the point is that as with shit so these are called boosted worlds right well uh essentially um we're applying a uh a velocity to the center of mass of the universe um uh that, that differs from that of our own um so because the uh the relative positions and relative motions of the objects within the material universe would all be preserved again such a boost would be empirically undetectable and so again we're going to get the problem that's not going to just be uh two worlds like this if we subscribe to euclidean uh, absolutism um because there are infinitely many ways of applying a boost to the center of mass of the universe so um we could uh suppose that it differs um from our world by any velocity that we like right so um uh the velocity could uh be directed in any way we like but it could also have any magnitude that we like um so uh, uh you know it could be uh one mile an hour or two miles an hour or three miles an hour or it could be 1.1 mile an hour or 1.11 mile an hour and, and so on so you obviously you get infinities here right so the this so clark recognizes this possibility in fact he points out this possibility uh even though he's an advocate of of newton's um, but Leibniz doesn't like it, right? So Leibniz thinks, well, this is kind of absurd to suppose that there's an infinity. And just the, the argument pattern's just really the same as with the shifted worlds. Uh, to suppose that there's an infinity of boosted worlds um, that differ uh, from ours, but only in an empirically undetectable way. Leibniz thinks it would be preferable to go with a theory that doesn't uh, generate this infinity of possible worlds um and it looks like um uh, uh relationalism doesn't right because uh the worlds don't differ in any of the the spatial relations between objects okay so leibniz thinks that these are both sort of strikes in favor of of relationism okay so now okay right so yeah, I, I, section 2.3 on the handout really just sort of spells this out. I've, I, I've kind of said a lot of this already. So um, uh, I put it in terms of a sort of structured argument that the relationist might uh, utilize against the, um, uh, against the absolutist. Um, the argument, you know, if you lay it down as an argument, it's not, it's not as though... It's entirely like a knockout argument. I mean, not many arguments in metaphysics are entirely knockout arguments. Um, um, it's not as though all of the premises are undoubtedly true and the conclusion uh, follows necessarily from the premises. It's more like, well, <laughs> maybe the premises look plausible and the premises give weight to the conclusion, albeit they don't conclusively establish it, even if they're true. Um, so it's not as though there's no way for the absolutist to resist uh, the, this argument. Um, so for one thing, they might might think that the Occam's razor is not such a big deal. That would be one of way of resisting it. Um, um, or they might they might think the Occam's razor is a big deal, and yet they might um, argue that although their theory is complex in some respects maybe because it entails um uh infinitely many shifted or boosted worlds maybe there's there's a offsetting simplicity somewhere else um or maybe they think that yeah again occam's razor is a big deal and their theory is more complex just all over than the the relationist theory uh but nevertheless their theory can explain more stuff than the relationist theory now remember that sort of a kind of plausible construal of Occam's razor says that if you have two scientific theories or if you have two metaphysical theories and they explain the same stuff, then go with the simpler theory. 
Um, now, if it turns out that um, absolutism and relationism don't explain just the same stuff, but actually absolutism explains more stuff than relationalism, then the fact that relationalism is simpler is kind of neither here nor there, right? Occam's razor doesn't uh, seem to support it in that circumstance. In that circumstance, um, so so in fact, um, actually, it's that latter response that that's possibly the most plausible one, as we'll see for the the absolutist um, to pursue. But we'll come back to that in a moment. Now, I think, so one thing to kind of note is that um, um, both Leibniz and Clark, they're not only operating under the assumption that uh, if there were absolute space, then it would be Euclidean in structure. They're also operating under the assumption that something like uh, Newtonian mechanics is correct. Um uh, you may be incorrect. Um, I, maybe I, uh, the reason I say something like Newtonian mechanics rather than Newtonian mechanics is, as we've seen, taken at face value, some of the Newtonian laws seem to presuppose absolutism. So Leibniz obviously doesn't want to presuppose absolutism. But um, my sense is that he thinks that um, something like Newtonian mechanics could be preserved, even if we did away with the assumption of absolutism, right? And you know, it's it it. We'll see later in term that it's it's it, there's there's some credibility to that. So, but, but the point is that both are uh, are operating under the assumption that at least something like Newtonian mechanics is correct, and that is what helps motivate. Uh, their claim that well, there would be no empirical difference um, between our world and the shifted or boosted worlds. Um, and that's justified in terms of Newtonian mechanics uh, because those sorts of shifts and boosts, um, not only do they preserve uh, distance relations between, I mean, just in virtue of the space being Euclidean, they preserve distance relations between material objects. Um, but also, crucially, um, Newtonian mechanics doesn't take shifts or boosts to be relevant to the predictions of any of the laws, right? So it's possible that even though, you know, you could imagine a mechanics on which even though distance relations were preserved, there were still empirical consequences to shifts and boosts, right? So, I mean, like, just imagine a totally crazy physics according to which um, the colour of every object depends upon where it's located in space-time. Then if you shifted things, everything would change colour, so uh, you'd have an empirical sign, right? Now, obviously, that's just a silly example, but it's just to go to show that things other than distance relations um, uh, uh, can change and uh, be empirically discernible. Um, but if we assume something like New Newtonian mechanics is true, then nothing like that is the case. So uh, shifts and boosts just don't make a difference to uh, what we observe empirically. Okay. Now, okay, so... That's quite a lot to take on, but um, I guess the advantage of, uh, of recorded lectures is you can take a break and uh, uh, have a cup of tea halfway through. But we'll press on. Um, and uh, so you might think at this stage, well, OK, so Leibniz has an argument for relationalism and it seems pretty good uh, on the face of it. Yeah, I, you know, it seems quite persuasive. Um, uh, but didn't Newton have an argument for absolutism? And didn't that seem kind of persuasive too? Um, the bucket argument that we considered last week. Um, so you might sort of think, well, how are we to how how are we to evaluate the relative merits of uh, relationism and absolutism, given that there are you know seemingly quite persuasive arguments on each side? Now, actually, it's interesting 
because um, there seems to be a direct relevance of the bucket argument to what we've so far been considering. So we noticed that we noted that um, there's a sense in which boosts and shifts are symmetries in Newtonian mechanics. That is to say, a boost and a sh or a shift doesn't make any empirical difference if Newton Newton's laws are correct, right? So, uh, the uh, provided um, everything else remains the same, uh, if you merely uh, shift everything in a particular direction by five meters uh, in the material universe, or if you um, set it so that it's in motion uh, five meters a second, say, uh, relative to the matter in our universe, then Newton Newtonian mechanics isn't going to predict any empirical consequences for that. Um, which is why such worlds would be indiscernible from our own. But while those boosts and shifts um, are, in, those, in that sense, symmetries of Newtonian mechanics, circular movements are not, right? Accelerations aren't, right? So a shift is a change in absolute position, a boost is a change in, um, uh, or a difference in, in, in absolute velocity. But a circular movement would be a, a change in, in absolute acceleration. So you could sort of imagine, right? So if you're a if you're an absolutist, then um, it's gonna make sense not only to talk about boosted and shifted worlds, um, but also rotating worlds, for instance. Um, so a rotating world would be one in which um, uh, in terms of the matter within it, all of the distance relations and relative velocities and so on um, are preserved. And yet the entire material universe is, is spinning. Um, uh, you know, we, maybe we, we suppose that it's not in, in this actual world, um, and that, but, but it could be in some other possible worlds, or maybe it is in this actual world and it's not in other possible worlds. But the point is, if you're an absolutist, there's a fact of the matter about whether it's spinning, right? Because uh, absolute space-time gives you uh, 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 the sort of point of reference. Um, um, uh, it gives you something with respect to which it could be spinning. Now, so, so this gives us a sort of third class of worlds. There are sort of boost worlds that differ from ours. Um, just by a uh, uh, um, by a translation, uh, there are so sorry. Those are shift worlds. There are boost worlds that differ from ours in that the uh, the center of mass of the universe is boosted, or it's traveling um, at a uniform velocity relative to our the center of mass of our universe. Um, but there are also spinning worlds, right? So this is a third category of world that the absolutist um, seems forced to, to, to acknowledge. Um, uh, worlds that differ from ours in that uh, they're spinning or they're spinning more or, or spinning less, spinning at a higher or a lower rate. Now, spin, as we've noted earlier, um, um, is an acceleration. Right, so it's uh, a change in direction. Now, we noted that um, just now that uh, boosts and shifts uh, don't make any difference to the uh, uh, don't don't empirically make any difference according to Newton's laws. Um, uh, in other words. Newton's laws are insensitive to absolute position and absolute velocity. That is to say, um, the, what really matters um, for the predict, predictive consequences of Newton's laws um, is not the absolute position or absolute velocity of objects, but their relative positions uh, and velocities. Um, um, 
So although, so I mean, this is interesting because although um, Newton and his look, his way of stating the laws seem to kind of presuppose that that um, uh, um, space is absolute. Um, actually, position, absolute position, and absolute velocity uh, don't, in fact, um, make for any empirical consequences if Newton's laws are true. But critically, what does make for an empirical difference is is absolute acceleration and we've actually we've seen this already we've seen this already in the form of the bucket argument um so it's actually quite important that um what uh, the bucket argument involves uh, an experiment in, in which there's acceleration um and not just something like uh, you know, a position or a, a velocity. Um, uh, spinning does have empirical consequences in, in Newtonian physics. Accelerations do. And I, I suppose a sort of simple way of, of, of thinking about this is that accelerations feature in Newton's laws. So uh, in particular, the second law, which says that force equals mass times acceleration, maybe maybe the most famous law, Um um, you know, acceleration is a variable that that features in that law. So obviously, it looks relevant uh, to the Newtonian laws, uh, and and that's the case. Um, and so what we saw in the bucket experiment is the fact that the water is accelerating um, makes a difference an empirical difference it makes a difference to the observable shape of the surface of the water right vis-a-vis -vis the case where uh the water's not moving um uh where where the surface of the water is flat so there would be um empirical consequences um to uh a, a, a spinning world um and so it's not the case that our world is indiscernible from a, a spinning world as it might be from a shifted or boosted world. So this kind of relates back to this question about Occam's razor, right? So remember, Leibniz is keen to point out that shifts and boosts at least if we assume that an absolute space time would be euclidean space time and if we assume that um the mechanics that are true the physics that's true is something like newtonian mechanics newtonian physics um then a shift or a boost would make no empirical difference um and so it seems kind of odd to suppose that those are real possibilities um and in particular he thinks it seems odd to suppose that um the the metaphysical view that makes them genuine possibilities namely absolutism uh so he he's reluctant to uh endorse absolutism because it generates this infinity of of shifted and and boosted worlds that are empirically indiscernible from our own and so, you know, so the idea, remember, was that maybe relationism is just simpler, right? It doesn't posit this extra structure, namely absolute position um, and absolute motion um, that seems not really to be doing any work in the, the Newtonian laws, that doesn't seem to be um, uh, leading to empirical consequences uh, with the boosted and shifted worlds being dramatic a exemplifications of that fact, right? So the fact that you could shift or boost the entire material universe and not be able to tell the difference uh, if Newton, Newton's, if something like Newton's laws are true, uh, I guess radically illustrates the fact that um, absolute position and absolute uh, velocity are just not doing anything in Newton's laws in terms of giving you empirical consequences. So one way of thinking about Leibniz's argument is just saying, well, 
you know, why posit them at all? Look, if 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 something like Occam's raised is right, we should just dispense with absolute position and absolute velocity. Okay. However, we've now seen that absolute acceleration does make a difference, right? So spinning worlds would be discernible uh, from the actual world, just as uh, the spinning um, bucket or the spinning water is discernible from the stationary uh, or the non-spinning water. Okay, so so then at that stage, the absolutist might say, aha, okay, so uh, this, this is good for me. So um, uh, absolute acceleration does play an empirical role in, in uh, predicting some empirical consequences. Um, so we have reason to endorse the existence of absolute acceleration. And you might think, well, once that's acknowledged, then the absolutist just wins, right? And the reason for that is that acceleration is defined in terms of velocity, and velocity is defined in terms of position. So we've got the equation, standard equation on the, the handout. So A is acceleration, V is velocity, and X is position. So uh, acceleration... Um, as standardly defined, just is uh, the first derivative of velocity and the second derivative of position. So you might think, well, you know, if you need absolute acceleration to explain certain empirical consequences, like the the the, the shape of the the water in the bucket experiment, um, then you're going to need absolute velocity because ap absolute acceleration is just going to be uh, the derivative. Of absolute velocity and in turn you're going to need absolute uh, position because absolute velocity is just the derivative of absolute position um, and so this you might think well the whole game is now won for the the absolutist um, um, so <laughs> what, what more is there left to discuss right now there is <laughs> as you might expect uh given that we're still talking about it there is still more to discuss so you might think actually you know well um okay maybe the 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 uh the absolute is on something here but it actually turns out that you can endorse the existence of absolute acceleration without endorsing the existence of absolute velocity or absolute position and basically the way you do that is you you kind of reject the standard definition of of acceleration now that's all too complicated for, for this week's lecture it's it's, it's going to warrant a whole lecture in itself and that's going to be the topic of of next week's lecture um next week's lecture con con concerns galilean space time um galilean space time differs uh from the sort of uh, space-time assumed by Newton, in that although like Newton, um, it recognizes the existence of absolute acceleration, unlike uh, uh, Newton, the, the sort of space-time that, that Newton supposed, it's not committed to the existence of absolute velocity or absolute position. Um, so we reject the definition of acceleration in terms of, or absolute acceleration in terms of absolute velocity and absolute position. Um, so we'll 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 come back to that as I say next week. And I mean it's sort of interesting that that Galilean space time, uh, as you might already start to think, looks something like a halfway house, right? So it's one in which we've got absolute acceleration, but not absolute velocity or absolute position so you might think well you know this looks like a compromise between absolutism and relationalism but we'll much more on that next week but um finally for this week i'm going to turn to a, a rather different sort of argument for absolutism um that actually is very it's just very different from uh the the argument of put forward by Newton, um, and also rather different from um, the sort of response that, that Leibniz gives, and uh, a sort of very different sort of argument. 
but again it appeals to um a sort of uh to, to space-time geometry or sp a spatial geometry i should say for now um and in particular to an earlier point that we noted that there's an isometry of uh, euclidean space um that's not direct um uh, or orientation preserving um, and we saw that an, an instance, uh, an example of such an isometry is is reflection. Um, now, what's it, so Kant's going to try and leverage this uh, the the non orientation preserving feature of reflection into an argument uh, that space is absolute and not relative so like it's the uh, before the argument's given it's com i think completely unobvious how this argument's going to go and that's sort of <laughs> i think that that goes for many of Kant's arguments they, they're, they're totally kind of ingenious in that um they uh they're they're uh really kind of outside the box reasoning that um that uh where we get very surprising uh conclusions from premises that that seem fairly innocuous so okay so as a bit of background um if we think about objects that are mirror images of one another that differ from one another by a reflection um we'll see that they have certain interesting features so an example, um, examples of sort of objects that are mirror images of one another are things like pairs of shoes, pairs of gloves, uh, pairs of feet, pairs of hands. Um, they, 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 they're sort of mirror images of one another. Now, that simplifies a bit because um, obviously even a brand new pair of shoes, they might, you know, wear one might be slightly creased in a way that another isn't or might be slightly bigger than the other or uh, you know and so on and, and likewise with hands and feet and gloves and so on um but like it seems at least in principle possible that um you should have um objects that are mirror images of one another that, that don't um have you know differences because of various blemishes and so on so we'll we'll make the simplifying assumption that we uh, we've, we've, we've got such a pair of objects. Now, the idea is that um, these objects are going to be identical in their intrinsic properties, right? So um, take this sort of ideal pair of, pair of shoes that uh, really are perfect mirror images of one another. Um, then they're the same color, they're the same size, all distances and angles between their parts are the same. In other words, they're the same shape. Um, so they they're the same in all intrinsic properties, um, and essentially this is what Kant means when he calls them counterparts of one another. However, what's interesting about these counterparts is that because of their difference in orientation, there's no way of rotating them or translating them or doing some combination of rotation and translation that could bring, say, the left shoe to occupy exactly the same uh, spatial region that's initially occupied by the right shoe, even if we move the right shoe out of the way. And reflecting that fact, um, Kant says that counterparts like left and right shoes are incongruent. So I just have a little um, uh, video that... Uh, course involves my dog George um, and uh, and sort of illustrates that so I'll, I'll just play this this video for you um, so basically you know this isn't a great pair of shoes I guess to illustrate this with because you know they're kind of old shoes and so they're, they're not even particularly particularly closely resembling one another but you know, they, they sort of make the point um, so the, the, the shoes are, are mirror images of one another roughly speaking um, However, they're not, uh, they don't have the same orientation, right? So uh, I guess I, I've turned the sound off on the video. 
Um, you can watch it with the sound on if you want. Um, roughly, they're, they're sort of a reflection in the, the line that I'm roughly indicating with my hand there. Um, but uh, they don't have the same orientation, so um, uh, maybe there's more curve on the left hand side of the left shoe and more curve on the right hand side of the right shoe, um, or something like that. Um, so, so the the the, the counterparts, all the, all the intrinsic properties, at least roughly speaking, are the same between the shoes. Um, so, so we want to say they're counterparts, they mirror images of one another. Um, but one's definitely a left shoe, and the other's definitely a right shoe. Uh, they have orientation, um, and because of their differing orientations. Uh, they're incongruent. So there's no way I could move um, the right shoe um, so that it would occupy perfectly uh, the region initially occupied by the left shoe. So look, I've, uh, I've, I guess I've rotated the right shoe. Uh, but still, you know, we've got a problem trying to fit the right shoe into the space occupied by the left shoe. Because the problem is the heel's a bit bigger, it's a bit higher than the, the toe of the, the left shoe. Um and likewise, you know, because the, the the curves are different on the right shoe and the left shoe, if I just sort of move move the right shoe across simply to the place where the left shoe is, that's not gonna work. And if I flip one over, then maybe we've got the, the curve on the left side of both, or the greater curve on the left side of both. But the problem is that the sole is bigger than the the top of the shoe, and so so again, even even if we flip uh, the right shoe and then move it across, it's not going to occupy exactly the same uh, the same region of space that was initially occupied by the left shoe. So that that's basically the problem you've got. So that's why Kant wants to say that they're incongruent. Okay, so I mean, like actually, Kant Kant's example is one of a hand or. A a pair of hands rather than a pair of shoes but the same same idea holds now so here this is what Kant's argument says right so Kant suggests that we consider a world in which there's only one object right so uh, I guess uh, the physicists are probably rolling their eyes at the moment and thinking typical uh, uh, philosopher uh, thinking of this bizarre possibility but on the other hand I think we, we can just point back uh, the physicists and Newton and the fact that Newton certainly himself uh, came up with these rather fanciful thought experiments like the spinning globes thought experiment. So it's not something physicists are immune to either. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the Kantian example is we're supposed to consider a world in which the only object is a hand. Kant reckons that such a hand will have a determinate handedness. So it's going to determinately be either a left hand or a right hand. Um, how does he motivate that? Well, um, uh, he motivates it by saying, well, you know, look, if we've got this one hand and we were to add a second hand to the universe, then either it would have this, the second hand would either have the the same handedness as the first hand, or it would have the opposite handedness to the first hand. And he thinks that suggests, you know, there'd be a fact of the matter. Either it would be the same handedness or it would be a different handedness. So he thinks that that implies um, that even without the second hand, there's a determinate fact of the matter about what handedness or orientation uh, the first hand had even on its own. So he thinks the single hand in the universe has a handedness or an orientation. Now, as we've noted, left and right hands, um, setting aside uh, you know, subtle differences, are intrinsically the same. They mirror images of one another. Um, they're the same, that is, size, color, texture, and so on. So the handedness of the hand um, uh, could only, it seems, be grounded in non-intrinsic properties of the hand. Uh, that is to say, relational properties of the hand. Um, now, the problem is that in this universe under consideration, where the only thing that exists is a hand, there are no objects, no other objects. So there's no uh, uh, other objects that the hands can bear relations to. Right, so the thought so far is uh, the 
object has a definite handedness um and yet a, a left hand is intrinsically identical uh to a right hand so what makes it the fact that this hand that's alone in the universe has the handedness that it does either as i say a left hand or a right hand well it can't be an intrinsic property because uh, a right hand has intrinsically the same properties as a left hand. Um, so it must be something relational. But it seems that in such a universe where the only thing that exists is this hand, there's nothing for it to bear any relations to, right? At least no ordinary object. You might sort of think, well, maybe we could sort of ground it in relations between parts of the hand and each other. Um, but that doesn't seem to work either because it seems on reflection that parts of a right hand have the same relations to other parts of the right hand as parts of a left hand to have to other parts of a left hand. So the same degrees of distance and angular separation from one another um, and so on. So Kant's thinking, well, you know, if the difference between a, uh, a left hand and a right hand can't be grounded in the intrinsic properties of the hand because intrinsically they're the same and it can't be grounded in a relation between the hand and any other sort of regular object because in this universe under consideration there are no other regular objects how are we to ground it well Kant rather ingeniously says um, well it must be grounded in a relation between the hand and space itself, because that's the only other thing that exists in the universe in question. But, and I guess here's the punchline, if space is the sort of thing that can stand in relations to things, then it seems that space itself must have an independent reality. It must be substance-like, because substances are the sorts of things that can... Uh, stand in relations um, and so Kant thinks that on the basis of this sort of thought experiment we should infer that uh, space is substance like which is to say absolute um, it has an independent reality and that it's the, in the relation between uh, the hand and space itself that uh, provides the orientation of space. Okay. Now, I guess then there's a sort of question about, you know, well, that's sort of weird. Um, you know, what sort of relation could the hand bear to space itself that gives the hand its handedness or its orientation? Um, now, I guess the sort of answer, like it's not totally clear from what Kant says, how he thinks about this um, and the answer is going to wind up being quite potentially quite complex um, so I think it's sort of worth kind of stepping back a bit um, to think about this so um, forget the hands example for, for a moment and think about something rather simpler um, now think about a two-dimensional space um, which could be approximated by a uh, well, I mean, a sort of, a, yeah, sheet, a sheet of a paper or a blackboard or a whiteboard or something um, a, a approximate, I mean, is, is roughly a two-dimensional space. Um, I guess it's not quite because it's not infinitely thin and so on, but um, it approximates it. It kind of approximates a Euclidean space as well. So um, it's kind of, it kind of behaves like a Euclidean space, a sheet of paper does, at least as long as you lie it flat on a desk. Um, it's, it's not a perfect approximation because obviously a, a, a piece of paper is an infinite in extent, so it has boundaries. Um, but it'll do for present purposes. So if you write, uh, or especially if you type a, a B and a D um, on a, a bit of paper, then their mirror images like i guess if you choose the font right uh the the font i've chosen on the handout seems to do the trick um these are mirror images of one another the b and the d are mirror images of one another 
And just like the hands or the, the shoes in three dimensional space, uh, there's no way you can maneuver the B and the D around the paper uh, by rotating or translating so that the D comes to perfectly occupy the region that the B initially occupied. Um, right, so I mean, I guess you can try um, and, and you'll find you can't do it. Um, on the other hand, again, if you <laughs> if you select the right font, then a D and a P, so again, in this uh, um, Cambria, I guess I'm using, um, the, 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 the D and the P um, are likewise counterparts in the sense of sharing all their intrinsic properties with one another. Um, and they're congruent because you can just rotate the, the P uh, so that it comes to, and I guess move the D out of the way if you like, so that the P comes to occupy exactly the same region that was initially occupied by the, the D. So, yeah, I mean, rotate the, as I say, rotate the P through 180 degrees and then we get a D uh, as long as we're using this font. Um, okay, so... So we can do this by simple rotations with D and P. We can, uh, they're congruent counterparts in this um, piece of paper space, this uh, roughly two-dimensional, roughly Euclidean space. Um, now, I think, so what's worth bearing in mind is that although the B and the D are incongruent, within the two-dimensional space, they're actually not incongruent in a three-dimensional space because there's a sort of operation that's possible in the three-dimensional space that's not possible in a two-dimensional space. Namely, we can flip the D uh, in the third dimension uh, so that it becomes the B, right? So if we're able to flip it in our third dimension, sort of outward from the paper, the two-dimensional paper, uh, then we can get the B back, right? So um, so actually, it's interesting that um, whether two objects are congruent or not uh, seems to be determined in an important way by the nature of the space. So um, um, uh, relative to a two-dimensional space, uh, the B and the D are incongruent, but relative to a three-dimensional space in which we can flip relative to the third dimension, uh, they're congruent. So <laughs> uh, maybe to, relative to a four-dimensional space, hands are congruent. If we could flip them in a fourth dimension, I don't know what that would mean, but uh, <laughs> at least... I guess, um, and and you can't imagine it. So, but that that that's that's pure speculation. Um, but certainly, this this seems to be the case in this example with respect to this lower dimensional space. Um, it's also interesting to note um, that there are even some two dimensional spaces in which the B and the D are a congruent rather than incongruent. Um, and a sort of special example of this is uh, a Mobius strip. Um, so your piece of paper lying flat on the desk um, roughly approximates a Euclidean space. Uh, as soon as you start to twist and fold it, then the, it, it, the, its resemblance to a Euclidean space is, is greatly diminished. Uh, and one thing you can actually do with a piece of paper um, is turn it into uh, a Mobius strip. Uh, basically, the easiest way to do that would be to sort of cut a strip of the paper. Um, then what you do is you kind of bring it round into a circle, that strip, uh, and then you twist it, right? So you just flip one side, one end of the paper, Um through 180 degrees, and that gives you the Mobius strip that's illustrated in figure four. Now, I mean, you can, I guess you can try this. It's, it's sort of rather, rather <laughs> a bit a bit awkward to try to do this, but um, um, what, what, what will happen is if you, in that space, 
have a um, a, a D um, and just move the uh, D along the surface of that space, um, then uh, once you go all the way around, then you end up with a B, it turns out. Um, and so although the D and the B are incongruent in a two-dimensional Euclidean space, it turns out that they're not incongruent in a two-dimensional Mobius space. Um, so that's interesting. I've got a like a video of it um, that wh wh where I'm trying to illustrate that um, uh, on the the Moodle page link from the Moodle page. I'm gonna play it now. It's not like it's not very satisfactory as a video. Um, it's sort of kind of difficult to show um, uh, in a recording. Um, uh, at least, like, unless you've got someone, I guess, like, with te technological competence, like, uh, editing the video and so on. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully you can sort of conceptually get the idea, and you might, you, it might help you to watch that video, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so what, I guess what, so we step back a bit from Kant to, to discuss the, the way in which um, whether two counterparts are congruent or incongruent might depend upon the structure of the space as a whole, right? So we saw that the D and the P, um, oh, sorry, D and the B, um, are incongruent in a two-dimensional Euclidean space, but congruent in a three-dimensional space where we can flip over with respect to the third dimension, and also congruent in a uh, two-dimensional Mobius space. So, returning to the question of what exactly is this relation between an object and space itself that gives the object its orientation, maybe it starts to look like a, um, uh, a really actually quite a sort of profound relation between the object and the structure of space as a whole, right? So, um, I, and what I mean by that is sort of if you consider, for instance, any short distance along the Mobius strip, that's going to approximate a uh, two-dimensional Euclidean space, and the B and the D are going to look incongruent. It's only when you traverse the whole strip that you can bring them kind of into congruence, if you like. Uh, and so the fact that they're congruent doesn't look like a relation between um, the object and any local region of the Mobius space, maybe the particular region they inhabit, but rather looks like a relation between the object and the Mobius space as a whole. So if we if that if Kant's right that orientation is not an intrinsic property but a relation between an object and space itself it looks like maybe relatively a, a profound one between the object and space as a whole but yeah i mean this is getting on to quite deep um uh deep considerations um okay so Finally, so does this does this show then that uh, as count as count one as the game up for the the, the relationist? Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I guess not quite. So um, there are a few points on which the relationist could challenge count, right? So they might challenge the the sort of some of the premises of the thought experiment itself. So they might they. They, I mean, you, they could sort of simply aim to deny that a single hand uh, or a, a possible world with only a single hand in it is a world in which that hand has orientation. So they might say, you know, look, we disagree. We think that um, uh, orientation is inherently relational. And when they say relational, they're going to want to say uh determined by relations to other objects. So maybe a um, uh, a left hand, or sorry, maybe I should say a hand can only have orientation if another hand, maybe an incongruent hand exists. 
Um, and there, there are other strategies they might try, right? So they might say, um, uh, uh, this is a sort of somewhat complex one. They might say, as so indicated as one on the handout, they might say that orientation should be understood not as a relation to space, uh, but instead rather as a kind of modal property. So they might think, look, it's neither an intrinsic property nor a space spatial relation um but rather it's a kind of modal property um so um something like a relation across possible worlds rather than a relation within a possible world um so you might say for instance that the hand so that you might acknowledge that the hand the lonely hand uh the hand in a world that contains no other objects has orientation, but say that um, what it is to have orientation, why it has orientation, is that there's another possible world uh, in which both that hand is present and a incongruent counterpart of its present. And you might say it's because of that possibility, even though that possibility isn't realised, that the hand has orientation in the original world. Anyway, it's just this is sort of like a, a conjecture. So, I mean, uh, I, a lot more work would have to be done to sort of try and make that case in detail. Um, and I guess another strategy might be, so we already considered they could simply deny that the lonely hand has orientation. Um, or they could say, look, it has orientation, but not because of its relation to space, but rather its orientation is a kind of modal property of it. A third option might be to say that the hand does have orientation um, and we can understand its orientation as neither an in a sense, neither an intrinsic property, nor as a relation to space itself, but rather as a relation between the hand and itself, a relation that the hand bears to itself. So it's a relational property, but a relation between the thing and that same thing itself. So, I mean, the big question is how they would sort of seek to cash that out. Um, but here's a sort of thought. Um, if you consider a a B shape um, and uh, the sort of B shape uh, in a two dimensional space, then in a Euclidean two dimensional space, you can't get from the B back to the B itself by means of a straight line, as long as a straight line has some non zero length. In a Mobius space, you actually can get from the B back to itself by means of a straight line. So the B kind of bears an interesting relation to itself in a Mobius space that it doesn't in a Euclidean space. So this goes to show that, you know, so maybe we could sort of leverage this into uh, an explanation of the orientedness of uh, the B in the uh, Euclidean space that it lacks in the Mobius space. Maybe we could somehow explain that in terms of the fact that it has an interesting relation to itself in the Mobius space that it doesn't in the Euclidean space. Now, I'm not going to, you know, obviously a lot of work would be done to develop that, need to develop that line of thought. And also, it's worth pointing out that uh, if we're true relationists, we can't just say, uh, we can't just help ourselves to the notion of Euclidean space and uh, Mobius space, because for a relationist, space itself isn't absolute. So, actually rather we'd have to try and explain the idea that um, 
the objects embedded in a Mobius space or a, a Euclidean space um, in terms of spatial relations. So we'd have to try and reduce this idea of Euclidean space to spatial relations or the idea of Mobius space to spatial relations um, so that there's not really a space over and above these spatial relations. But again, we're getting into quite deep waters um, here. And this is just sort of intended as a kind of pointer in the direction of um, uh, responses that the relationist might make uh, in trying to deal with Kant's argument. But certainly it's an interesting and thought-provoking argument. I hope, hopefully you'll agree with that. Okay, so that's all we've got time for. In fact, we've gone way over time for this week. Um, and um, uh, uh, so next week, we're going to focus on a theme that arose earlier or uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, namely Galilean space time, um, which looks like it might be a, a decent compromise between Newtonian absolutism and Leibnizian relationalism. Okay, so that's it for this week. So thank you very much.